Alright, hello everybody, and today I'm going to be proving Jordan's lemma, or Jordan's lemma, if I was to attempt to pronounce it in French. But uh, yeah, this is quite a nice result from complex analysis. It allows us to make some specific assumptions about contour integrals when we integrate along specific paths of specific functions. So yeah, let's just get right into this proof right here. So what exactly does Jordan's lemma say? It says that if we have some integral over some semicircular arc in our complex plane, let's call it CR, of some function f of z, so some complex valued function. I'll talk about what functions we're allowed to have later on. And we can also actually have some kind of exponential term, so let's say e to the i a z, so we have a real number a right here. And then the lemma says that if we take the limit as our r approaches infinity. So we're considering our arc getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If we integrate along that arc right there, we actually end up with a zero in the limit as our r approaches infinity. So let's say we took some kind of semicircular contour to integrate across. So let's say something like that. And let's say this upper arc right here, this semicircular arc was some kind of CR like so. If we integrate along this arc right here, so our semicircle has a radius of r. If we integrate along the arc and take the limit as our r approaches infinity, the value of this arc actually does not con contribute anything to our contour. So as I said before, we need to impose some kind of condition on our f of z right here, our function. Because one of the most common functions that you'll deal with are rational functions. So if f of z was some kind of function which you can express as, let's say, p of z, over Q of Z. And P and Q, they're generally polynomials, so complex polynomials. And if we're dealing with this type of function right here, we actually need to have another condition, namely that the degree of Q minus the degree of P is greater than or equal to one. So if, say, for example, the degree of our Q was, I don't know, five, that means the maximum degree that our P can have is four. So that then ensures that our Q the degree of our Q is always greater than the degree of P. And you'll see later on why this is important. But uh, until then, let's just keep our function as f of z right here. So back to the actual proof. How can we prove this thing right here? Well, let's actually just ignore this limit first of all and just work with this integral right here. And also this zero, let's get rid of that. So if we have some kind of integral over some kind of curve, it would be a nice thing if we can parameterize this path a little bit. So a nice way to do this is just to do a simple substitution. So let z be equal to r e to the i t, where our t goes from zero to pi. So if you imagine our, um, our path right here on the complex plane, it makes sense because we're starting at t equals zero, which is right here, and then we're going all the way around to pi radians. So, so just using this complex exponential function right here, and of course our radius is r. So this um, parameterization works right here, and of course differentiating both sides, we're going to get dz being equal to r e to the i t dt. And now what we can do is plug all this stuff into this integral right here. So this integral, that's equal to the integral. Now instead of going along this path, we're going along our parameterized interval right here, so from zero to pi. And then we're going to have f, and now instead of z, we're plugging this thing into here, so r e to the i t. And then e to the i a, r e to the i t. And then our dz becomes i r e to the i t dt. All right, so from here, what can we do? Let's actually call this integral something. Let's call this integral i for now. And what we want to do with i is we want to kind of estimate it a little bit, so find some kind of upper bounds for it. So what we can do is if we take the absolute value of i, we can say that it's less than or equal to using the integral inequality. The integral, so the same integral right here, but of, of the absolute value. So pretty much we're bringing this absolute value inside of the integral. So now we're going to have absolute value of f, r e to i t. And then since we're taking the absolute value of this whole entire inside right here, and everything's being multiplied together, we can actually split the absolute value up. So just splitting the absolute values up right here. So we have absolute value of this whole exponential junk right here. And then taking the absolute value of i, well, that's just one. Taking the absolute value of r, that's just r. So let's actually bring that to the front. 
And taking the absolute value of this e to the i t right here, that's actually always equal to one because we're just on the unit circle. So we can ignore the absolute value of that and just end off with a dt. So from here we want to kind of simplify things a bit because notice this exponential term right here. We can actually rewrite that a little bit because notice right here, e to the i t right here, we can actually use Euler's formula for that. So if we expand that out a little bit, we're going to get e to the i a r and then cosine of t plus i times the sine of t. And notice from here we can distribute this a little bit and also since after doing that we're going to get two separate terms right here in the exponent. What we can do from there is split the exponent up into the product of exponents. So if we do that we're going to get e to the i a r cosine of t then we're going to get e and then i and i right here notice that that's a negative one so we can have negative a r sine of t. And you see right here we're taking the absolute value of this thing. So we're taking the absolute value of all of that chunk. So after we expand that out a little bit, we're still taking the absolute value of this thing right here. But notice we have a multiplication right here. So we have a product. So we can split the absolute values up a little bit. And then right here, e to the i a r cosine of t. This part right here, a to r cosine of t, that's just some real number because notice t we defined as some kinds of real parameter. So that means the cosine of t is still some real number and of course multiplying with a and r, that's still a real number. So e to the i times some real number, the absolute value of that is actually just one. So we don't need to worry about that. And then all we really have left is e to the minus a r sine of t. But notice that exponentials right here, they're actually never negative, they're always positive. So we can ignore the absolute values on this term right here. So what did we just find out right here? We can rewrite this whole entire integral a little bit, but replacing this whole junk right here with just this part right here. So if we do that, we're going to get r times the integral from 0 to pi, absolute value of f, i to the i t. And then this part right here, we know that it just evaluates to e to the minus a r sine of t dt. All right, so from here, what we want to have a look at next is this absolute value of this function right here, because we can actually further estimate this integral a little bit if we can find some kind of upper bounds for this thing. So let's take a look at the absolute value of f times r e to the i t. How can we kind of estimate this right here? Well, remember from the very start that we said that f, we can write this as some kinds of function p, over q, where the degree of q minus the degree of p is greater than or equal to 1. So if we want to find some kind of upper bound for this, some kind of, I guess, maximum, we actually need our p to be as big as possible. So we want the degree of our p to be as big as possible. So just as a little, I guess, analogy, if we take one third right here. Let's say the degree of our p is 1 and the degree of our q is 3. That's obviously less than two thirds. And you see, 2 is the biggest value we can take for the degree of our p because it's only one less than the degree of q. So if you can kind of take that thought process, all we can say from this is that we want to have our polynomial on the bottom, let's say with a degree of n, so qn, qn cubed 3, and then the degree of the polynomial on the top has to have a degree of n minus 1. This will kind of give us like the biggest function we can have kind of. So let's actually do a little example. Let's say our n was equal to 3. So on the denominator, we would have, for example, z cubed plus z squared plus z plus 1 or something. It could be any polynomial. I'm just writing out a simple one. And then on top, we're going to have z squared plus z plus 1. And notice if we plug r e to the i t into this whole thing right here. This e to the i t, we can kind of forget about it because when we swear it or cube it and stuff like that, if we take the absolute value, it's just going to do absolutely nothing. So we can kind of forget about that. The main thing is what happens if we put this r into it. So if we put our r into this function right here, remember from the very start that we wanted to take the limit as our r approaches infinity. So our r is going to be a very, very, very big number. In doing so, these leading terms on our polynomials right here are going to be the dominant terms because all of these latter terms right here, they're just going to become more negligible as our r gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So all of this latter stuff right here, we can actually kind of ignore that because it's just going to be negligible and if we can kind of simplify this a little bit notice that we're going to get 1 over z 
And remember, these can be any polynomials actually. So what we can say is that we can include some kinds of constant up here because we don't know what this constant is, but we know the upper bounds for this polynomial right here is something over z. And remember, we're plugging r e to the i t into this z right here. So just plugging that in, r e to the i t. Of course, we're taking the absolute values. And then this e to the i t will just disappear off to one. That's why I didn't really take it into account seriously when I did this polynomial stuff. And of course, here over r, we can kind of assume that some positive number. So we don't, we actually don't really need to worry about these absolute values at all. So that was probably not the most rigorous proof for finding the upper bound of this function right here. But you can kind of see, and it also, also makes sense that we can bound this function right here, the absolute value of this function with c over r. So c over r, whatever c happens to be, this would be kind of like the upper bound of our function right here. So with that out of the way, we can do a nice replacement on our integral because notice the absolute value of a function right here is less than or equal to this thing. So if we plug this thing into our integral right here, what actually happens is that we're going to get a smaller valued integrand. And just by logic, if we integrate a smaller valued integrand on this interval right here, we're obviously going to get a smaller value. So this whole thing right here, we can say that it's less than or equal to r times integral from 0 to pi of c over r, so just making that replacement with this part right here. Then we're going to have e to the minus a r sine of t dt. And just bringing these constants and stuff out to the front, and just notice that these r's here can cancel out. And then we're just going to be left with c times some integral from 0 to pi of e to the minus a r sine of t dt. All right, so from here, what exactly can we do? Let's take a look at this sine function right here. So what exactly does the sine look like? Well, on this interval right here, it just looks like some kinds of hump like so, so from zero to pi. And notice that if you consider the area that the sine makes with the positive x-axis right here, if we integrate our sine from zero to pi, that's actually the same thing as integrating from zero to pi over two, and just multiplying the result by two. So if we have the exponential of our sine right here, the, the symmetry actually doesn't change. I think we'll get like some kind of shape like that or something. So the symmetry actually doesn't change on this interval right here. So we can still rewrite this little bit as being twice the integral from zero to pi on two this time of e to the minus a r sine of t dt. And why exactly did we do that right here? Well, notice that on the interval from zero to pi over two, if we consider our sine function right here, so this is from 0 to pi over 2, we're going to have a local maximum on our sine right here. And if we construct a linear line, so a straight line from the origin all the way up to that kind of a maximum right there, you can actually see that our sine is always greater than or equal to that line right there. So if we have that factor right there, we can further bound our integral right here. So let's just go ahead and do that. Notice that this point right here, this maximum has coordinates pi and two, as well as one. So if you consider rise over run, so one over pi and two, you're gonna get two over pi. So if this is kind of like our t axis right here, so we're dealing with the sine of t, we can say that the equation of this line right here, that's just simply y equals to two over pi t. And just from this picture right here on this interval, we can see that our sine of t is greater than or equal to two over pi times t. And why is this fact right here useful? Well, notice at the moment we're taking e to the minus a r sine of t. But we know that our sine of t is bigger than some other function right here. And what does that mean? Well, if you imagine our exp exponential but with a negative argument right here, it's going to look something like that. Okay, and let's say our sine of t was, I don't know, right here, for example. So this point right here, let's say it's a sine of t. We know that it's greater than or equal to 2 over pi t. So maybe 2 over pi t lies somewhere right here. And notice that the y value of this point right here, that's obviously greater than the y value of this point right here. So what I mean by that is that this whole integral right here, that's less than or equal to 2c times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of e to the minus a r. And instead of sine of t, we're going to have 2 over pi t. 
because what happens is that if we take e to the minus some junk times 2 over pi times t, that's going to be greater than if we had the exponential of some negative sign right here. And what was the reason for doing so? Because this integral would be extremely hard to evaluate. But now what we've done is we've shown that it's less than or equal to some integral that we actually can evaluate using elementary methods. So this whole integral right here, that's just an exponential integral. So you can treat all of this junk in front of the t right here as some kinds of constant. So if you evaluate this integral right here, what, we, what you should get is that it's equal to 2c times 1 over negative a r2 over pi. So we're taking the reciprocal of this constant in front of the t right here. And then we're going to still have the same function on the top. So e to the minus a r 2 over pi t. And we want to evaluate that from 0 to pi over 2. Let's try and simplify this. So we're going to have a negative. Pi is going to flip up to the top. And then on the denominator, we're going to have 2 a r. And then what happens if we plug pi and 2 and 0 into this function right here? Or well, plugging pi over 2 into here, notice that it's going to cancel out with this 2 over pi. So overall, we're going to get for the first part, e to the minus a r. And then we're going to subtract this function evaluated at the lower bound. So plugging 0 into here, this whole entire argument here will disappear and we're just going to get e to the 0, which is exactly 1. Okay, notice 2 and 2 here will cancel. And then we can bring this negative into here. So overall, we're going to get c times pi over a times r of 1 minus e to the minus a r. So what did we just find out all together right here? Notice that this integral right here evaluates to this result right here. And if you consider like the chain of inequalities we had, we always said that something was less than or equal to something else. So going all the way back to the very beginning, we took the absolute value of i and we said that was less than or equal to some junk, less than or equal to some junk, less than or equal to some junk, which evaluated to this thing right here. So c pi times a r and then 1 minus e to the minus a r. And you see, originally we wanted to take the limit as our r approaches infinity. So what we can conclude from this is we, if we let the limit as our r approaches infinity on our absolute value of i, that's going to be less than or equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of this thing right here. Let's just call this thing, I don't know, omega or something and you see in the limit as our r approaches infinity right here this denominator is just going to blow up and that means this whole entire thing right here just vanishes off to zero so we know that the limit as our r approaches infinity of our omega right here that's going to be exactly zero so in the limit as our r approaches infinity of our absolute value of i that's going to be less than or equal to zero. But notice we have absolute values right here. So that means this part right here is always a positive value. So that means the only way if it's less than or equal to zero is if it is zero itself. So that means if the absolute value of i, the biggest value you can get to is zero, that means we can con conclude that the limit as our r approaches infinity of just i itself is going to be equal to zero. And remember that i was our kind of parameterized integral, but that was the exact same thing as our original integral. So all in all, if we take the integral over some semicircular arc CR of f of z, e to the i a z and dz, and we take the limit of this thing as our r approaches infinity, it's going to be equal to zero, as we just proved. So uh, there you go. That is the proof for Jordan's lemma. And that is the final result we get out at the end. So uh, yeah, whenever you're evaluating contour integrals with that, which concluded some kind of semicircular arc, and you know that our function f of z right here can be broken down into some p of z over q of z, where the degree of q is greater than the degree of p, then you can just use Jordan's lemma right here to say that the integral over the arc right there, that just goes to zero in the limit as our r approaches infinity. So yep, hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see everyone next time.